Hello again and welcome back to the Day of Daily Bible Study. We're continuing on with Paul's letter to the Colossians. We're in chapter 2 and we're going to start in verse 8. Before we do, let's pray. Loving God, we thank you that you are here with us. We thank you that you give us uh, the real foundation upon which we should build our lives. Uh, Lord, help us to learn what we can learn, but Lord, to always come back to you because you are uh, where we will find life, where we will find truth, where we will find meaning uh, to live. Lord, help us during this time. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So this is where we read uh, what Paul has to say. He says, See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception, according to the tradition of men, according to the elementary principles of the world, rather than according to Christ. For in him all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. And in him you have been made complete, and he is the head over all rule and authority. And in him you were also circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, and the removal of the body of flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised up with him through faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. When you were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive together with him, having forgiven us all our transgressions, having canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us, which was hostile to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. When he had disarmed the rulers and authorities, he made a public display of them, having triumphed over them through him. So one of the things I, I, my academic work was on the one hand in theology, but it was also specifically in uh, a discipline called the philosophy of science. And it's not necessarily philosophy generally, but it's like how have we understood how we know the world and, and what does it mean to engage with the world and why do we engage with the world? And one of the things you find, and so I, I, I got interested in philosophy not because I hoped it would teach me about God, but because I hoped, and it really has proved fruitful, it helped me understand ways that people have thought throughout the years because what I found in my theology classes in seminary was behind something that I thought, this is ridiculous, this is dumb, I can't believe anybody believes this, there was something in the background philosophically that helped to, under, to, to make sense out of why people thought the way they thought. Didn't make it right, but it made it understandable. And if I could understand it, I could engage with it. If I could engage with it, I might be able to give somebody a better way of thinking. Well, if you read through a history of philosophy, uh, or even if you don't read through it, but uh, you, you pick up one and look at it, you'll find that at least the standard way that it is introduced is that philosophy, as we know it as a discipline today, uh, is often credited as beginning in Greece. I mean, there might be further research that, that shows this at work in other places too, but philosophy as a discipline that we know it in the West, we trace it back uh, to Greece. And it goes back before Socrates, although he was vitally important, but it goes back to the pre-Socratic philosophers. And one of the things usually you get credit as being the very first philosopher is a man named Thales. And Thales, one of the things he was trying to understand was how, what is the world made of? You know, what is all this about? And at the time, it was widely considered that there were four basic elements that the world was created of. Uh, it was earth, and it was wind, uh, air, and it was water, and it was fire. Those are the four elements. Sometimes you had a fifth one called ether, but ether's got a whole complicated history on its own. But, so you may mostly have these four elements. And so Thales comes along and says, what if you know, that seems too complicated to have four basic ideas? He says, I think that it makes more sense to say that one of those is at the root of all the rest. You know, one of them is where we find real truth. One of them is the building block. And he says, what is everything really made of? And his conclusion was that everything was really at base made out of water. And so fire and, you know, earth and air all ha are different forms and complicated uh, natures of water. Now, today we find that laughable. Um, but at the same time, this idea of getting down to what is at the root, what is at the root of things, what are the foundations of the world was a key driving thought force uh, in the early Greek world. Um, and it would have been still very much alive and well uh, by the time Jesus was around. And so when we talk about this idea of, you know, um, you know no one, saying to it, no one takes you captive through philosophy and a deception according to the tradition of men, according to the elemental principles of the world, rather than according to Christ. Because the thing is, it's like, it's like the people are saying, we, we have these experiences, they all look the way they are, but sometimes the appearances are deceptive and we want to really get down to what really is the truth. What is the foundation of the universe? What is the foundation of our lives? What is it that we can really put our feet down on 
um, and, and make sense out of. Now, there's a whole tradition after Thales about water that, that there were other people who came along and said, well, no, everything's really fire. No, everything's this way. Uh, there, was, there was one person who says everything, the one true thing is that everything's changing. Someone else comes along and says, no, the one true thing is that everything is really the same and our perception that things change is an illusion. Some of them use that as a basis to try to prove that movement is impossible and therefore just an illusion. It's a whole wild <laughs> history of philosophy. But what I think Paul's doing here, in, a, in actually a really interesting way, if this is what he's doing, is Paul is trying to say, you want to know what's at the foundation of the world. You want to know what the elementary principles of this world are. And you think it's things like water and fire and being and all the rest, or you think it's got to do with these other things. But he's saying, but what really is at the core of it, what's really the foundation of the world is Jesus. And it's part of why I think he's trying to emphasize the fact that Jesus, you know, that the, that the word of God, um, the, the pre-incarnate Christ, you know, part of the, we say the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we'd say God was always Father, Son, and Holy Spirit long before Jesus came. So this Son of God uh, really is the foundation of, our, of our, all of our world. And it's part of why he says that, that, that everything was made through him and for him, that this is really the foundation. Now, that's got to be a hard sell for some people because they, 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 they're asking a different question about foundations. They want to know what is everything made of. And Paul is trying to say, it's not a question of what things are made of. It's a question of what they're made for. You, know, you want to have a foundation for your life. You want to know what's a foundation you can, you can uh, you know, manipulate and do stuff with. And Paul's saying, I have a foundation that you need to build your life on. You know, that that's the real foundation. He says, everything else... You know, he talks about you. This is, I think, this made a difference for you. You've been made new. You know, Jesus canceled out the debt. You know, he's made us alive together in him. He says, all the rest of the stuff might be interesting. He says, but the real foundation that you care about that will actually make a difference in your life and actually affect how you interact with other people and how you live your own life is that this Jesus has come and built on it. And the fact of the matter is, you know, over the years, there, there was even one, some person in the early church, or in the, not in the early church, the early pre Socratic philosophers who said, um, that, that the world's made up of atoms, little indestructible pieces of stuff. And, um, and for over a thousand years, they all said, that's ridiculous. Well, then it came back again, as, as I'm sure you're aware, because we believe in atoms again. Well, and then we get down to smaller and smaller particles within atoms, and now we're talking about these, these, these subatomic particles, and we don't really know all of what they mean. We have some ways that we can think about them, you know, but it's one of those things where we get down to the basic building blocks of creation, and we don't know what's there. We can't put our hands on it. We can't do anything with it. It doesn't really affect our lives. And so I think it's worthwhile to say, that's all great. Let's learn about it. Let's probe to the depths of it. Let's find the mysteries of creation. But in the midst of that, let's not forget that our real foundation, our real building block, our real basis for everything that we do in our lives is that Jesus has come and made us new. Because if we forget that, then none of the rest of it really matters. We can have all kinds of knowledge about various, about the, you know, the Higgs boson and all the rest, and it doesn't change our lives. But if we have Jesus living inside of us through the power of the Holy Spirit, uh, we cannot remain unchanged. And for me, while I find all that stuff interesting, that's really uh, where the rubber meets the road. Well, that's all for today and all this for this week. Come back again next week. We'll have more, another week of daily Bible study. Have a good day.